Good afternoon by about a second, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a really fascinating topic, and I'm glad to see that we've gotten a great response to having today's event. As you know, uh, because you most of you work here, that today is a pretty raucous day on the Hill. So we're gonna ask you to be a little accommodating on the schedule. Uh, Senator Markey is here, so we are gonna get started in just a moment, but he, has, his, he and his office have asked if we could um, recognize the shootings in Florida with just a moment of silence. Thank you. And because he is a gentleman who needs no introduction, I'm going to straight into having Senator Markey uh, come up and tell us what he's been working on on the cybersecurity bill. Thank you, Shane, uh, so much. We thank uh, all of you for uh, coming out here today on this very, very important uh, subject. Uh, and uh, thanks to AEI for hosting this important uh, briefing. Um, we have cyber threats um, that are uh, uh, now increasingly uh, at an exponential level. Uh, threatening just about every aspect of uh, the way in which we live. Uh, I have been partnering with uh, Congressman Ted Lieu uh, on important legislation. Uh, there are roll calls that are being conducted in the House of Representatives right now, so he will be joining us um, in a very brief period of time. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Shane, and thank uh, our panel, uh, Chris Calabrese, uh, Rena Mears, and Robert Stein uh, for their uh, excellent work uh, in this subject material area. And uh, I want to thank everybody else who is here right now uh, and participating uh, in a discussion that is important today but is going to become only more important as each and every year goes by. And that's because cyber attacks know no partisan divide. They present a clear and present danger to our economy and to our democracy. Uh, but they are certainly not a new threat. For decades, we have needed to develop a national cybersecurity policy to address the dangers of the digital revolution. One of the tools in our cybersecurity toolbox should be my legislation with Congressman Liu, the Cyber Shield Act. We don't just need a shield against attacks, we need a shield for our families, for our children, for our privacy. Today we are entering a new phase of the digital revolution, the IoT, or Internet of Things era, where our devices, our appliances, our machines now connect with one another. But make no mistake about it, IOT also stands for Internet of Threats, because each and every one of these devices is something uh, that can be compromised in a way which affects the privacy, the security of everyone. With as many as 50 billion IOT devices projected to be in pockets and homes worldwide by 2020, cybersecurity will continue to be of paramount importance to literally every business and family in our country. And that's why I am proud to partner with Congressman Liu on the Cyber Shield Act, which would create a voluntary cybersecurity certification program for IoT devices like the Energy Star program for energy efficiency and the NHTSA Five Star Automobile Safety Rating System, our Cyber Shield system will allow consumers to identify IoT devices that meet cybersecurity standards. To create the certification program, our legislation will establish an advisory committee of cybersecurity experts from academia, industry, consumer advocacy communities, and the public to create cybersecurity benchmarks for the IOT world, for the Internet of Threats world, which grows by the day. 
there, there are things that, uh, that uh, we have to already begin to be concerned about. Baby monitors, cameras, cell phones, laptops, tablets, all of them potentially compromisable in a way that most people, unfortunately, don't even really think about but they should be thinking about it. And that's why this conference is so important, because you are thinking about these issues. You're thinking about the safeguards that have to be built in. We moved a long way to a point where we said, you know what, medicine, there should be safety caps for children on medicine. There should be seat belts and airbags and back seats for children to be protected. We didn't start out that way with automobiles, but over time, people just kept saying, we need more protections. We didn't start out that way with medicine, but then we realized we need more protections that are put in place. This happens in every single area of American life. The technology begins, and there's a Dickensian quality to it. It's the best of wires and the worst of wires simultaneously. The best of technology and the worst of technology simultaneously. It can enable, it can ennoble, it can degrade, and it can debase all simultaneously. It is the job of policymakers to make sure that we derive the benefit from these technologies and to minimize the harm, which is in fact created for families all across our country. That is our responsibility. And we've done it in every other area of American life, and we're going to have to do it with this technology as well. Because technologies, in fact, are neutral. They don't have a personality. They don't have values. The values which each technology have are given by human beings to those technologies. We animate the technologies with our values as a society. And no technology is immune to this, including the internet of threats as it continues to explode. So under our legislation, the IoT manufacturers can voluntarily certify that their products meet these industry-leading cybersecurity and data security benchmarks and display this certification to the public. Consider it the good housekeeping seal for cyber safety. This bill has four main benefits. It will enable consumers to make more informed decisions when purchasing their devices. It will reward businesses adhering to the best cybersecurity and data security practices. It will create a roadmap of improvement for manufacturers that want to improve their devices and, and improve uh, the cybersecurity uh, that is there for data and for the devices themselves. And finally, it will protect businesses, children, and millions of Americans who use these internet of threats devices. So we're here to talk about the sinister side of cyberspace. We're here to talk about the harm which can be inflicted upon individuals and families if we do not think through what the consequences are. With enemies known and unknown on the cybersecurity offensive, we must double down our efforts to forestall these cybersecurity threats. Our cars can be hacked, our computers can be breached, our devices can be monitored. We need to reassure families that there is a way to protect themselves from the threats of the 21st century. And I thank you all for uh, attending here uh, today. And, um, and I'm especially uh, grateful that uh, uh, Congressman Liu is here as well. Uh, we are partnering on this legislation in order to use a common sense approach uh, that ensures that uh, families understand how secure all of these products are. And then they can make decisions for their families in the same way they can for the automobiles they drive in terms of safety, in terms of whether or not the medicine 
uh, bottle has a child cap on it, uh, in terms of whether or not there's a safety lock on a gun. All of these things are just fundamental to whether or not um, we are going to provide the security for families which they need. We thank all of you for being here, and it's a great honor for me to be partnering here with Congressman Liu on this legislation. So thank you all very much. As I said, we're go I'm, I'm passing through the regular bios, but I do want to point out for those of you who don't know that you are one of only four uh, um, science majors in Congress, you, computer science majors. Sorry, a little specific there. Um, so I just want to thank you ahead of time for all your expertise that you bring to the table. So we're very, very lucky to have you here. Oh, good afternoon. Actually, let me clarify that. I'm a, I'm a recovering computer science major. Uh, so very uh, honored to be before all of you. Uh, I know uh, Senator Markey has to uh, leave shortly, so I'll be brief to give you the overall concept of what we're trying to do. If you walk into a Target and you buy a lamp, right, you don't expect that lamp to explode in your home. Well, why is that? It's because there are these different certifications uh, that uh, the manufacturer goes through and Target has learned that if we buy these lamps that have these certifications they're not likely to blow up in people's homes and it doesn't make our company look bad and it doesn't uh, have folks sue us so that's what we're trying to do uh, with uh, the cyber shield program it'll be voluntary but products that have it there's some level of trust that when you get it you're not going to get hacked and why is that important well you imagine in the future where you're very connected you have internet of things and you live Right in Senator Markey State, it's really cold in the winter. You leave and you have this automated um, temperature control. You don't want a hacker to also turn that down to zero degrees, right, and cause all sorts of problems in your home. Or if you have your stove that's electronically connected, you don't want someone to turn that on and try to set fire to your home. Uh, there are all sorts of things that hackers could do that could be very problematic with all these Internet of Things devices, including as well just spying and surveilling uh, what you're doing and then using your uh, Internet of Things devices to spam others, which can uh, actually cause websites to get shut down. So there's a whole host of things we're trying to stop uh, with this program and look forward to answering any questions you may have about it. And it's really an, a joy and honor to work uh, with Senator Markey. And thank you so much for having me here. All right. We are going to do a couple questions here, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience so you have a chance. And Senator, I just want you to know that I was hoping to start with a question from what I'll call the home team, which is MIT. Uh, they were, they're looking forward to watching this video later since we're not live broadcasting, but I said, do you want to do the opening question? And I, they've sent me two, and it, they're both so complicated, I'm going to have to ask them to put them in writing. Uh, because I think the thing that we're, we're all very interested in is people who work around regulation and understand that the, um, the, the Internet and the Internet of Things is going to run at a very swift pace. How is the regulation going to keep up with the, the ability for the technology to keep advancing? Um. Well, uh, you're constantly being given uh, you're constantly okay. being given uh, messages yeah. from whatever company you subscribe to to please uh, push now to update your software. Please push now to update the security. We have found a breach. You should take the patch now. You know, please do that. So the way you keep up is the way we keep up. That's how you do it. You know, you, 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 the, the industry can find a way if they want you to pay them more money you know, for some new service that they want to provide to you to make sure you know about that and you can easily uh, uh, opt into that new service, right? Well, you can do the same thing for ensuring that they know that there's a glitch, there's a problem, there's an opening, there's a vulnerability, and it should be fixed. And as the company, we want to fix it, right? And they should. And if they're not going to fix it, then we should just know that there is a vulnerability that industry-wide has been identified, and here's a company that's not fixing it. So I don't think it's that hard, and the information is pretty easy uh, to communicate in a modern world. It's very inexpensive for the company to do it, but it's also very inexpensive for, um, for there to be an identification of the companies that aren't doing it, so people can know that that product uh, has not been brought up to uh, snuff in terms of the protections that are there. So you can't have it both ways. On the one hand, you can't say, you can't say, you know, our company can take a uh, zeros and ones and send them from here to Osaka and back 
in under a nanosecond. And then you say, oh, by the way, uh, can you have this uh, ability then to communicate with the same zeros and ones that there's a deficiency and there's also a software patch that is now available to fix it? And they go, oh, you have no idea how complicated that is, okay? <laughs> the same geniuses, okay, with advanced degrees and 800s in their boards all of a sudden because their profit margin might be impacted by having to build in a little more safety. That's what the auto industry said about seatbelts. That's what the auto industry said about airbags. Do you know what? What you're asking us to do? Do you know how expensive that would be? And that was until they polled the public and found out that 99.9% .9 of all Americans wanted uh, airbags that work, wanted uh, seatbelts that work. So that's how I view this issue. Uh, it's just a technology uh, update. Uh, and if you're not doing it, you should be on this list. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But that's your product out in the market now uh, that will be branded as something that's a one star. You can make it a five star if you want, but not until you upgrade that security breach that has been identified. Thank you. And Congressman Liu, since it is a, a SEAL program that you guys are recommending, what happens if they do fall behind and they are no longer in the best practice range that has been uh, defined? Uh, so the company would lose a certification, uh, but we've uh, put various uh, sort of checks and balances as legislation so that the commission has to reevaluate evaluate uh, the benchmarks. Uh, it's meant to be a living, breathing process, so it would change over time as technology continues to change. And it's something we envision where uh, the manufacturers and businesses will work with this commission on an ongoing basis. And it's not a static sort of law. It will change over time. So if we don't embrace this from a regulatory perspective, is there a concern that the courts will end up being the de facto decision maker in this? Uh, you're saying? You're asking if there will be lawsuits against yes. companies because right. <laughs> they did not engage in best practices? Yeah, well, you know, the first case in your torts of law book, first year of law school, um, is a situation where um, the, the company had a boat, the boat's out in the ocean, uh, there's a storm coming, but they haven't installed the new radio technologies as of 1921 that would give you the warning that the storm is coming. And, uh, and all of a sudden, there's a new statute that says that you had a responsibility to upgrade so that you didn't lose those 20 passengers because you weren't willing to invest in uh, the radio technology that would have notified you of this weather condition. Huh? And then what we were all taught and every law student is taught is you lose the case because you hadn't updated. So what we're trying to do here is anticipate those law cases where you knew or should have known something that happened, you knew or should have known the technology that could have protected that family, could have protected you know, that business from the catastrophic loss, uh, and, uh, and all we're trying to do here is just in an anticipatory way, avoid having to go to the courts, because people will be going to the courts you know, to sue um, the living daylights out of companies that do not upgrade. This is a smarter way of going. It's an anticipatory way. Try to start out where you're going to be forced to wind up, my father always used to say. It's prettier that way. So this is a good way of starting out in the right place. Thank you. So you call out the um, NTIA at the Department of Commerce. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I apologize. It's a busy day. <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, so you call out the Department of Commerce, uh, NTIA, and I imagine they're going to work hand in glove with NIST on this. Um, but, uh, you know, the Federal Trade Commission has already started doing blogs on what to do when you buy and sell a home with safe devices. So uh, I guess part of the question is, like, you know, do we, who, are we engaging enough of the, the uh, tool set that we have with not only the federal but maybe the state government to make sure that consumers know where to look for information? So that's a good question. Uh, this legislation does have a very broad array of stakeholders. Uh, in addition to uh, federal departments, we have small, medium, and large businesses. Uh, we have uh, different representatives from, from different organizations. The FTC uh, is primarily an enforcement agency, so they would be helpful once this program was established to then try to uh, enforce certain aspects. But keep in mind, this is not designed to be punitive. It's not designed uh, for people to sue companies who don't have it. In fact, the law itself says just because you don't have one of these certifications doesn't mean that you can be sued because of that or somehow that your cybersecurity is not up to standards. Uh, it really is designed to let consumers and, and businesses and companies know that if there is this CO, 
there's some level of trust that the consumer can have that what they're buying has some minimum level of cybersecurity uh, attached to it. And then let me just follow up on a question you had asked Senator Markey about courts making law. Uh, so we were also taught in law school that bad facts make bad law. And invariably, you're going to have some bad facts, and then some court's going to get it, and they're going to make a decision. And that's probably not the best way to make law in this very complicated area of, of technology and, and cybersecurity. And you'd have different courts, potentially having different decisions. It's much better if Congress puts out, uh, in, in my opinion, a, a national standard uh, that's voluntary that companies can follow. So part of the challenge here is the collaborative element of how many devices are going to be attached. And again, that we're focusing on consumers today. Um, so for the home and all the new voice, you know, Alexa, we don't have as many Bixby users probably over here yet. Um, hey, Google, uh, Apple just put their home device out. Uh, does this get pretty tricky on, you know, who, who's in charge of, of what part of the layer of security? I mean, and how do we kind of manage that from a regulatory perspective? Cybersecurity is a, a massive problem, and I was on the oversight committee last term when we saw these massive breaches of our security clearance database, and about 20 million of these very sensitive SF-86 forms were stolen by a foreign government. Uh, that caused immense harm to our national security, even though it wasn't a kinetic attack. It was just a cyber intrusion. and. You have that all the way down to your individual consumer who buys a webcam not knowing that there is zero cybersecurity on this webcam. And not only could a hacker take it and then view what you're doing, they can then use it to uh, send all sorts of images to shut down another website because they get other webcams to all do the same thing. Uh, so we're just very behind in both the private and public sector. And in terms of Regulation, because it moves so quickly, my view is it's much better to have commissions and regulatory bodies deal with this than to have an actual statute with very specific words. So even having this discussion today is a forcing function to let companies know that they need to be thinking about these things, especially the collaborative effort of all the different companies that have to coordinate. When you think about the, all the different devices in your home, I know I was just looking at some of the ISPs, so let's say I happen to be a Comcast customer, so I started there, um, that they just bought a company, but they have X1, and what they're saying on their website is that everything that is connected, I can ask that everything that is connected be, they will queue that, and then that they will help me know whether or not their software updates, and they're doing this through, um, they have an open forum uh, group that they're doing standards with. Will this, this SEAL program recognize these standards, I mean the standards bodies that are being used by groups like Comcast or some of the hardware manufacturers? It would be up to the commission, but I, I think the commission would. Um, it, so, again, this is meant to give authority to a commission, and it's a voluntary program. Uh, so we're not trying to mandate certain things to happen, but we do want, again, consumers of business to have some level of, of trust if they see the seal. I now I'm envisioning that we need a virtual seal, and I'll be able to, like, roll my, my device over it, and I'll know whether or not they're up to date. So just a, a thought. Brain goes crazy. Um, all right, I'm going to open to questions in the audience. Do we have questions for Congressman Liu out here? We got one right back here, Hawkeye. And please identify yourself and whatever your affiliation is. Hi, my name is Marissa, and I Marissa, just, who are, can you tell us who you're with? Oh yeah, I'm with MPG. Um, and I was just wondering um, what the movement's been like in the, with this bill and the reception of your colleagues. Are they interested in moving this forward anytime soon? Or, because it seems like very important legislation that we would want to get on, like a seal on the market as soon as possible. So, well, th th thank, uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, we believe this can get bipartisan support because it, it's not a mandate, it's a voluntary program. The challenge is there are 57 crazy things coming out of the White House. And so, for Congress to try to deal with that, uh, is very challenging, and so a lot of times issues just don't sort of make it on the agenda because it's very distracting. Hopefully the White House will calm down, hopefully the administration learns better, and then we can get some sort of actual legislation through. So that's more the challenge. It's not that, it's not that people don't like the bill, it's sort of in the order of issues happening, right? You've got security clearances, you've got this, this, and that. There's sort of things that um, people want to address first, so that, that's where we are. Other questions? Got a question over here? 
we got the, I, I, I think we might be recording off this, but it's not giving us um, audible, so you guys understand that who are asking questions. Thank well, uh, my name is Henry Palmer. I'm a retired attorney in banking law, but uh, uh, with specializing in new electronic systems. So uh, my question to you is, is uh, do you, does your legislation envision that there would be panels, many, many panels? For instance, the automobile industry certification has got to, the process has got to be very different, I would think, than refrigerators. And there are so many different technological areas that I would imagine, as in the medical right. field, you have different panels with specialists in different areas. And I mean, it yes. sounds like it could multiply a... Uh, so that, that's a great question. Uh, so we envision this more for consumer products you sort of go into uh, a target and buy. So I, I actually have another piece of legislation specifically to cybersecurity and cars that I'm doing with Republican uh, Joe Wilson uh, out of South Carolina uh, as automated technology continues to advance and we're going to have automated vehicles. Uh, we believe we should have cybersecurity keep up with that. And so we've actually set up a whole different process uh, for automated vehicles, partly because, you know, if you go, if you, if you have this thing and it's hacked, right, it's not likely to kill you. You're in an automated vehicle at 60 miles per hour, it gets hacked, it's, it could kill you. So I think there should be a different process with that. And then you mentioned sort of medical devices. So it turns out that Underwriters Laboratory has, in fact, gone out and done cybersecurity standards for medical devices because they realize that can kill you uh, if it gets hacked. And so I do think there's different specific fields I probably have. They actually probably need either a mandated kind of sort of set of, of goals and standards or at least a higher one because they're at more risk of causing bodily injury or death. So our current cybersecurity laws, which I realize are still written really for analog ideas, um, doesn't allow for white hack hacking. So when you're talking about people that are um, looking this, looking at you know problems with the cars, you'd hope that those people that are creating the technology have the ability to think about all the terrible things that can happen. But as we learn every day, somebody figures out how to hack something that you hadn't thought about. So are you also looking in parallel to see that if these guys want to put together white hat hacking teams against their own devices, um, or as a, a collaboration, that they would be able to do that and not run into the challenge they have right now legally? Because they're not supposed to hack. Basically, you're not supposed to white hack somebody else's device, even if you're doing it in a positive aspect. Yeah, so uh, we're trying to address that at at the federal government level, the Pentagon actually started a hack, basically hack the DOD program for white hat hackers to hack them, and uh, they will in fact provide bounties uh, for people who, who do it within sort of certain requirements and standards. I've um, working on legislation right now with another Republican member of Congress called Hack the State that would essentially do the same thing for the State Department. Uh, so we're trying to... Did you pick them for a particular reason over... Did you like eeny, meeny, miny, mo on the department? Oh, <laughs> I, I happen to be on the Foreign Affairs Committee. So okay. that's why we did the State Department. But um, so there, I do think, frankly, all departments should, should do that. Uh, in, in government, in terms of the private sector, I have to... You raise a very good point. I have to look into that and see we'll, we'll send what could information for you on that. If they want to make their happily, it's just one of those questions us. that gets asked a lot because it's it always seems like it's with the best of intention, but we just haven't updated what we need for our own defense on that. Um, so I, we have time for one more question. The audience, oh boy, we're gonna have to pick. I'm gonna go with the in the middle here. Uh, gentleman in the blue. Sorry, we probably if, if the congressman's feeling generous, we might be able to get. Oh, hey, I actually just had a kind of a quick question. Maybe uh, my name's Blake Subcheck. I'm a reporter with E&E News. Uh, when you're going about trying to define things that are uh, quote regularly connected to the internet, uh, how do you how do you do that, and how do you determine kind of what is encompassed uh, when drafting legislation in this Internet of Things? Thanks. So the reason we're not very specific in this statute uh, is my view that. Uh, when it comes to technology, I think government should have a very light touch when it comes to actual laws, because to change an act of Congress, you uh, need another act of Congress, right? And that's not always so easy. Uh, I remember when I was in the California State Legislature and there was this bill moving through, I was in the State Senate at the time, and it was going to take um, these car sharing services like Uber and Lyft and so on and jack up their insurance requirements that they had to 
had to meet and, and, and how much they had to pay. <clears throat> and, I, and it flew out of the State Assembly unanimous, bipartisan support, gets to the State Senate, passes the first committee, unanimous bipartisan support, and then it gets to the second committee, and they're looking at it, and I thought, well, they have a very specific number in here, and what if we want to change that number two years later? Well, you need this legislature to do, again, pass a law signed by the executive branch. And I thought it was just sort of a silly way to do it. And then the way they defined the ride-sharing service, I thought, well, these companies keep innovating. It's, it's going to be a different definition. And while the bill was going through, Uber actually came out with another service, sort of a carpool Uber thing that sort of didn't seem to quite match the definition. Uh, so I, I voted no. And, and then I eventually convinced a bunch of people, along with other stakeholders, to, to vote no. And at the end of the day, they made it so that the bill was just like taxis. They, they treated them the same. And my view is if you're going to regulate, at least give it to commissions and regulatory bodies that if they make a mistake, they can correct it a month later or a few months later. So that's why we're going to have the commission decide that question that you, that you asked. Are you feeling generous for one more question? Sure. Okay. Question. All right. <laughs> the gentleman right to his, my right. There we go. Thank you. Hi there. Jay Jang with American Bankers. Uh, thank you for being here, Congressman. Uh, my question is, you know, looking at this legislation, you know, we're taking an approach to have the industry self-regulate in a sense and taking a light touch approach. Is that something you think is, can be applied in its approach to other forms of emerging technologies kind of in the broader ecosystem um, as a way to, you know, help sort of balance innovation while having the proper uh, protections? Uh, I think that would depend on the industry. Uh, the reason I think we should have a light touch when it comes to technology, um, so let me take a step back. I, I believe in legislatures. I believe we're a force for good. I believe we can make society better. But there are three things we are not. Uh, we are not fast. Uh, we are not precise. And uh, we are in no way elegant. Technology is exactly the opposite, right? It can be very precise, it can be very fast, it can be very elegant, it can do amazing things, and there's often this conflict between sort of, in my mind, government laws and technology innovation, and we're just really bad, in my opinion, at writing laws that try to define and, and, and try to sort of solve a problem through, through words. And so uh, that's why I think it's better leave it up to to agencies and bodies that can make changes and react much quicker uh, than you could with any sort of legislative law that if you want to change it, is very hard to change. Congressman, thank you very much for your time. Sure. And I want to say I think we've got the right person who's thinking about all these questions. So we really appreciate all your hard work on this. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to a panel discussion, and there will be more Q&A um, after our panel. All right. Uh, thank you guys for being accommodating. I realized that we just had to work with what, what time the senator had there, and uh, Congressman Liu sounds like he's really thinking quite a lot about this. Um, I don't think that the draft legislation that I originally saw had the commission idea. So um, I'm Daniel, if you're still in the room, I'm going to look forward to seeing that. But I think that's actually a really interesting new uh, thing that they have incorporated, which makes a lot of sense, since one of the things that this panel discussed yesterday in a prep uh, session is, you know, it's always a challenge to keep up with technology when, I, when it comes to figuring out how to regulate, especially on behalf of consumers. So what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is introduce themselves and explain why they're on a panel about IoT. Uh, Chris, do you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm Chris Calabrese. I'm the Vice President for Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, we sort of view ourselves as all things internet policy, uh, everything from privacy to free expression to cybersecurity. And, uh, you know, the Internet of Things is all about all of those things. So uh, it seems appropriate that we be up there. We, we appreciate the time and, and the panel. Um, and we appreciate you bringing somebody in to talk about some of the privacy issues as well, because security and privacy are flip sides of the same coin. So thank you. Great. Rena? My name is Rena Mears. I am a uh, head of consulting at DLA Piper. 
Uh, prior to that, I led, founded and led a big four uh, practice in privacy and data protection for about 15 years. And I work with clients every day in this space, and particularly in the connected world and in connected environments. So I come to you both as an older auditor, having been around for a long time, auditing in this space, as well as a solution provider, helping companies understand what's required of them and trying to meet what is increasingly a complex regulatory environment. Fantastic. That's why I'm on the panel. Great, thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'm uh, Rob Stein. I'm the Vice President uh, of Government and Regulatory Affairs at InterDigital. InterDigital is a uh, small 400-person uh, company with uh, well over 180 engineers uh, who have multiple PhDs and are significantly smarter than myself. Um, but the work that we do in network research wireless development is basically in the standard space. So we've helped create the standards on 2G, 3G, 4G LTE, and what will become 5G in the IoT. And right now we actually have a, a product called Cordon, which is a gateway technology for IoT and IoT devices uh, and working with standards bodies in the uh, 1M to M uh, community. Uh, you know, we routinely deal with cybersecurity and data security issues, so that's why I'm here. Fantastic. So I'm going to start with the idea of a SEAL program. I think that it's a really laudable goal um, because we know that we all buy light bulbs and different things that are around our home that have seals that we've grown up. We may not even know who, who does it, but that UL on a light bulb makes us feel better. Um, so when we're dealing in this really swift paced digital era where a lot of what we're talking about is machine to machine communication to each other, um, do you think that a SEAL program has the capability to capture the trust that, um, that the, the, the consumer needs? And I mean, are we, are we on the right path here for doing what I think the ultimate goal is, which is figuring out if we can trust these devices? Uh, well, I'll just go first and just say, yeah, I think this is a, is a very positive step on that path. Um, I mean, no one should mistake it for a solution to the broad variety of issues that are going to come up with the Internet of Things. But we've seen so far a lot of momentum behind the idea that we need better security standards in IoT. I mean, there's a lot, pretty much nobody thinks we don't. But we haven't seen a lot of coordination behind the, the kind of standards. I mean, we obviously have the, what NIST has generated, but we also have a number of private entities who've tried to put out different types of standards. And I think the result has been kind of a jumble and, and a lack of agreement. So I think anything that points people in the right direction and does it in this kind of light touch manner is going to begin to get us down the path. And I know we'll discuss more about some of the other things that we have to think about in IoT. But I think, to my mind, the thing that this does probably most importantly is begin to point us towards common standards and begin to think about what those standards might be. And, uh, and as we do that, I think we'll see more people, you know what, we're going to have to confront a lot of issues as we do that. But, uh, but m moving us towards a common goal, I think, is important, and one set by the government and sort of a neutral body. Great. Rena? Yeah. I think um, it depends on what you're trying to do with a standard. I've been around standards and seals for longer than I care to remember <laughs> uh, at this point. But if you're trying to regulate activity, that's one view of a standard and a seal. If you're trying to communicate something to the end user, that's a different type of goal. And you have to be very careful that you understand what it is you're trying to achieve. When I started as an auditor trying to think about SEALs, and in full disclosure, I'm one of the authors of Generally Accepted Privacy Principles. So if you want to throw something, you can now. But, <laughs> um, but actually, when we started with that, I think people will spend a lot of time saying what was wrong with it. And we looked over time at what that actually achieved. And what it actually achieved was awareness. People started to look for a way to respond to requirements that they were being inundated with and not having a real good structure. And so whether or not it achieved its purpose of precisely telling you what you must do, it did in time raise awareness and people's ability to respond to the request. So in that respect, I think SEALs actually on both sides, both for the product side and for the end user, serve a very valuable purpose. Great. Rob? Yeah, I, I, I'll agree with a lot of comments. Um, SEALs are good, um, but it does depend on the purpose. In an issue where we have connected devices, um, the issue becomes we have multiple standards on multiple devices in multiple verticals. 
and we need cybersecurity and data security rules to be dynamic. They can't be static. Um, we can't afford as an industry to have rules that may work on a Monday but no longer work on a Tuesday. Uh, because the industry and the technology moves so rapidly and so quickly. So it's, it's a great goal to have to create uh, a framework, if you will, um, to, to kind of outline the various topics and issues and, and areas of, uh, of concern. But to, to start um, creating mandates um, creates a significant problem because, you know, the Congressman Lou was talking, uh, he was answering a question um, uh, to the gentleman right over there about uh, he's thinking this is just to consumable goods. Well, the legislation that I've got in front of me says that a consumable good is really any product that a consumer can purchase. Well, that, that is a car. You know, that is a refrigerator. That is a, uh, uh, an, an IoT device that will be shoved into uh, to the home. Um, and all of these devices at, at some various time in the future will connect to the Internet. Uh, look at Teslas today. They download uh, updates to their software at night um, as they're, they're typically plugged in. So I would argue that a, a Tesla vehicle is a connected device that theoretically could be an IoT device. Uh, so y y we have various issues that, that I think we need to, to recognize and various verticals in the entire ecosystem that are important here. And so we just, it's not that SEALs and, 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 and the framework is, is, is a bad thing, it's just that the devil's in the details. And we need to be very concerned about making sure that a, a lot of voices are heard. Should I, can, we, can a dialogue break out? Absolutely. I? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, just curious, like, so I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit in this space. I agree with you 100%. The problem with security standards is they have to be dynamic. You know, st if you set static regulations, command and control, you know, two years, everybody's gonna hit check the boxes and then two years later, it's not gonna be secure, but you will have checked the boxes. But I do think that there's a lot of low hanging fruit, stuff like encrypted communication and authentication back and forth between the device and just, stuff that I, I think any of us would agree just makes sense. So I at least envision this as a more of a low hanging fruit, like here's the minimum that we can do. And then we're gonna still have to see other mechanisms like probably liability that are gonna maybe push to go beyond that low hanging fruit. But I mean, I guess maybe this is a little bit of what you see in the, you know, as you look at is what, you know, you bring to it. but. I'm curious about your sense as this is a low-hanging fruit option as opposed to a be-all, end-all. No, there's definitely a low-hanging fruit opportunity. Uh, I'm not going to disagree. The, you know, the issue becomes, okay, so are we talking about the device that may sit in the washing machine to tell the owner that, hey, you know, you know we got a water pressure issue here, so you may need to fix your, 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 your hose? Right. Um, or are we talking about the, the refrigerator that may have a, uh, a, a weight scale in one of the shelves that says, hey, you're running low on milk. Um, you know, do you want me to place the order for you? So the answer to your question is probably yes. <laughs> We're talking about all those things in some form or another. I think the risk here is one of an ecosystem, and you touched on that earlier. So if you, I'm looking at a seal as a method of communication, of expectation, and I as a consumer are looking at that, I'm looking for what information does it provide me. Mm. Well, the advantage of a seal, many seals, is that you get to have levels. You get to create m more statements with one seal. There's nothing that says a seal has to be, uh, you know, a, a GIF or a PIC or something on a, on a website. You can also actually incorporate it as sort of dynamic rules on certain types of communication or on different activities of a device, a feedback mechanism, if you will. So there are different things that could, this could actually become over time more dynamic than what I think we're giving credit to a SEAL for. I'm not arguing the dynamic effects of, of a SEAL. My, my statement simply is, as you're creating this, you need to make sure that all there are a lot of voices that need to be heard. Mm -hmm. You know, and <clears throat> what I've read in the legislation thus far there's no standards bodies that are, that are included in this. So 1M to M wouldn't necessarily be a part, and they are a global leader in IoT and data and cybersecurity. NIST is, you know, not necessarily included. So is their framework going to be, you know, included in this? And, and they've got years of, of uh, 
dedication and, and creation to uh, data and cybersecurity. There are a ton of other uh, verticals in not just consumables, but in healthcare and in auto that theoretically should be involved because we don't know what is going to come, you know, in, in the future. So, so can we go with a really stick, a real simple example here? Should a device have not be capable of having a default password? Should the device Should, not? Uh, well, I think that that's an interesting okay. question. I mean, I mean, like that. You, it's like, at some point, it, saying, it prompts you, or you have the ability to change. I guess I'm saying that I don't. That it, it, it's it's static. That you know the password never can. Like I, I was going to bring it, but I apparently threw it away. I had a Wi-Fi uh, router in my house, and I unplugged it and looked at it, and it just you know, basically told me the password. And, the, and I was like, I tried to go on and change it, and I couldn't. And I was like, I guess this is their point, right? You know, right. Like, can I change my password? I, I, I'm trying to think of a circumstance where I'd be happy to have any device in my house that I couldn't change the password. Or that actually has a password. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I mean, but maybe a SEAL could say, this device should not come inside the router of your home. Maybe this is, you know, if you've got an environment where, again, I'm really hard, kind of hard time thinking of what that environment might be. But, but, but you bring up a good point, but this, because this is a gateway to other devices, that most of this is not about a singular device, like the thing I pulled off, even though it was a Wi-Fi router. Um, it, it's about connecting the other items. That's what makes it interesting and why you want to buy it, right? Is it's going to make something in your house easier, even if it's just talking to another device. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to get to is what is the bare, I mean, you were saying low-hanging fruit, and I'm just trying to give somebody an example of what, what that would be. Well, I mean, the reality here at the end of the day, it's all about data. Um, and it's, you know, it's, there's data security, but then there's companies that want the data because they want to sell it. And, you know, there's, there's also a balance as to what the consumer is going to be willing to give up for their data. Um, now, this, I am not arguing one way or another, interdigital in, in our work, we do not collect data, um, but this is what the environment has basically become. It's those who want data and those who want to protect data. Um, and a SEAL can be very good for the protection uh, of data. And I would argue that passwords should be on virtually any uh, uh, device. So that's kind of talking to your low-hanging fruit right. example, um, and it touches on what you said. So if you set a minimum baseline or set of requirements for a SEAL, and then somebody says that they're actually going to comply with that. That is a legitimate good use of a seal for communication, right? It communicates to the end user what at least they can expect in these particular realms. It may not suffice uh, the, the, uh, the objective of a regulatory framework such as NIST or one of those. And I sincerely doubt if you're going to get one of those that's going to work across industry to your point. But again, I'm gonna come back to my original comment. Why, are, why a seal? Right now we have consumers going into their houses every day, again, because of convenience. They're going to adopt, they're going to use. It's going to enter in greater and greater form, and we're going to have a stronger and stronger ecosystem. At least provide the basic knowledge of what they can expect from that device, and I think that's a pretty important goal. If we do nothing else, that's pretty good. So I just want to shill a report that's not even our report, so I can, okay. well, we, we help. You can shill your reports too, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but I, I, well, I can shill our own, but so BTAG is a technical advisory committee. Uh, the FCC. In 2016, they published, in November 2016, they published a very easy to understand sort of layman's guide to IoT security. So they, it's literally, you know, pages and pages of low hanging fruit. It's, you know, the big telecoms, big tech companies, organizations like CDT, just all agreeing on what we think low-hanging fruit is. So to the extent that you want just a, a, like a, what's designed to be essentially a, you know, co a college freshman level understanding of IoT security, I think it does a pretty good job. Anyway, sorry, I just, so, it seemed responsive to the Sure, point. sure, absolutely. So the other idea that you brought up, and let me just grab a word that you've used before, Chris, is harvesting the data. So is the SEAL going to be part of, or would you recommend, if you were on the SEAL commission, that um, this is something I would know if I'm bringing something into the house, if I connect this, it's going to share or harvest my data? Well, first of all, it would be interesting if you knew that. I mean, there's so many ways to make that happen that I'm not exactly sure how any individual company would respond to that, okay? So I think that's an interesting concept. Uh, but I think it would be, uh, my concern is the ecosystem. 
And so recognizing that my, when I think of my, I think we're all used to the idea that our phones are now platforms, right? No one thinks of them as phones anymore. Well, now cars are platforms. I mean, I work in that business every day. They're platforms. Right. You know, the derivative product that's being created from data mining in a car, no one really knows who owns it, not even the people who are creating it. And so the level of data sharing is immense and going to get bigger. And so that ecosystem, trying to manage that ecosystem, I think is actually even a bigger question than just what is an individual product. And I think the risk with IoT is each individual product is so small. And it is doing such narrow things in many cases. But taken together, it is immense. And I don't see a SEAL being able to address the ecosystem very easily. So it's more has to be a supply chain issue and now you're back to industry, I think. I 100% agree, and, and I think just to put even a little bit more meat on it, so this ecosystem, right, each of those IoT devices is a vulnerability, right? It's inside of your router, in your home, it's inside your router, it's potentially, if it's I got a security flaw, it's not just a flaw for the device, it's a flaw for your entire home, essentially. So that's one piece. And then each of those devices is, is a pretty substantial data collector. Right. You know, they know a lot about you. So again, now you've got a, more vulnerabilities and you've got a greater data ecosystem that you're exposing. So that's your second one. And then your third one on top of this is you've got an ecosystem of devices that if corrupted can be used in other attacks. I mean, this is the dying example, right? So this ecosystem has become now something that if it's taken over can harm the entire ecosystem. So we're getting pretty far beyond the, the, the SEAL point of view and, and that's, not necessarily a flaw with the concept of a seal, it just emphasizes that this is a really complicated topic. And it's part of the reason why I'm, I'm kind of okay with starting to nudge us in a, a useful direction, because I don't think there's any one solution to this level of, of complexity. Right, and it goes to potentially having various different levels of security based upon the product and at what level within the supply chain or the, right. within the ecosystem. Okay. I do think there's one issue that we haven't talked about, and you may want to bring it up. I Oh, go for it. Is um, the fact of change. So sure. a company that's trying to comply or, or qualifies for the seal, and then somehow something changes and is no longer really qualified, how do you revoke that seal? And what's the mechanism for doing that? And I think that's a challenge. And that usually undermines the validity of a seal if you don't have that feedback loop available to you. So I think that's a pretty big open question. Yeah, I mean, this. Can we make the seal dynamic? I think is, is yeah, going to be an interesting I, I, question. You know, well, and, well, security is dynamic, right? Security is a process, not an end state, right? You must continue to be able to update the device, update everything that's connected to the internet, or you will quickly fall behind. What you know, whatever the state of the art security is, or not even state of the art, whatever is appropriate and necessary for security. So, yeah, the seal has essentially got to approve a, a process, not just a product, and I. And I'm not as much of an expert on SEALs, so I'd be curious if you know of or can think of a SEAL that is actually validating a process as opposed to validating an end state product. Not off the top of my head. That's not a great sign. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm yeah. you know, I'm in a particular space. But I'm interested in the idea of having a SEAL be dynamic and interactive. So that re it responds just like other metrics that we get routinely throughout networks and, and in devices where given it, the IoT uh, devices themselves very often are, uh, you know, do something if something else happens. Right. You know, so if you had a series of dynamic rules, it seems to me that, this, that it itself could then become part of it. And that's why I was bringing up the idea that there was a feedback loop that suddenly said, you're acting in a way differently than what you espoused. We're going to either, either withdraw the whatever we're using as a sign that you have a seal or stop your product, which would be a little harsh, but, you know, something like that, feedback. So since we're staying consumer focused today, because there's so many different directions you can go on IoT, what happens if something breaks my stuff? Who do I contact? Is it the Federal Trade Commission? Do I call my attorney general? Like, you know, as I, is, if this really causes trouble, I mean, I'm not going to go all the way to the dying attack from last year with the baby monitors. We, but that, that really highlighted a, a definite problem that I think Senator Markey noted that is, you know, we need to be thinking about this. But, you know, I come home and I have not chosen, I mean, and, and this is, I think um, you and I discussed this earlier, it's, it's a level of ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, like if it, there are, uh, are multiple, like the ISPs now have, you know, as I mentioned, um, X1 for Xfinity, AT&T has a 
version. I'm sure you know Verizon has a version. Cox probably has one too. Um, but they're nascent and they're getting there. But if I come home and I haven't protected my things and something breaks my stuff, if you're on this commission, who do you recommend somebody get a hold of? And maybe it's just a, hey, just to let you know, my stuff's broken. I don't want this to happen to someone else. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I think that this is just, this is the big L that we managed to not talk about, which is liability. Um, somebody is going to be liable, and we, there's a whole process that's going to have to happen to sort out who's liable for what, right? And I don't, I mean, you could certainly call all of those people, right? You could call your attorney general, you could call the FTC, and they would all have tools that they would be able to employ. I think that we're ultimately going to have to sort out some rules about, you know, about liability in order to sort of do the, you know, offsetting of, of uh, you know, um, negative externalities that cybersecurity is. I think we, get, we have a, a lot of steps before we actually get there. And th one of the things that this SEAL process could do, for example, is begin to sort w the difference between uh, vulnerability and a defect, right? Because no software ships perfect. It just doesn't happen. So that has to be accepted as part of, unless we're not going to use these products, that has to be sort of accepted as part of the cost of doing business. So when does it jump from being an acceptable vulnerability that all software has some of to a defect where you have liability? Now, that's a tough question, and it may have to do with how long have you known about it? Have you been alerted to the, the problem? Have you done anything? Do you have a process for fixing it? A SEAL program could begin to set some of the baseline for that, could begin to level set it. They're not going to answer those problems, but they could begin to point us in the right direction, and I think then you could s sort out some of the liability from there. I think this is a, a snarl. I mean, I don't know. A snarl. Is that a, is that a legal um, term? Because <laughs> I go in, you know, well, because I'm, I do a lot of forensics work, and, you know, you go in even in, a, in an organized system, and you try to find out where the vulnerability occurred and where the, um, the actual defect or, or where the attack actually created an opportunity uh, for an event or an incident and possibly a breach. And if you're in the complex, you know, you even look in our, our financial systems, you look in those complex networks, the rules about where liability sits, given what has happened in the system, are thick and heavy and legalistic and have been fought in the courts and everywhere else for years. And so when I look at a home that's become a platform, and I look at the immense number of, of possibilities for IoT, I live in this business, I should be terrified, and yet I gladly take the technology that's coming in my door to make my life easier. You know, am I a little more cautious than maybe the, some people are? Maybe. But on the other hand, I still love it. And so when I see my, you know, stove doing things for me, my refrigerator, if it can order my food for me, is delightful. You know, if I can have somebody at the door delivering for me when I walk in the door, I'm going to take advantage of it. So that ecosystem is just going to grow. And so the complexity of that ecosystem and the liability for an event inside it is just mind-boggling to think about. And so I think there's going to have to be some set of rules that are going to apply at some broader level, uh, rather than to try to do it the traditional way of every little piece gets, you know, sues everybody else or tries to get out of the liability. I, I said the other day, when I look at derivative product in data in these environments, everybody sticks their hand up for who owns the data. I do, I do, I own the derivative product. Who has the liability associated with that derivative product? Everyone <laughs> hands come down. <laughs> right. Um, Rob, asking you a slightly different question is our industry guy on the panel. Who do you want to hear from? Hello. Somebody, if you get to choose from that group of people, you're like, um, you know, I'm going to take the FTC. I mean, like, I mean, is there one that's actually going to be collaborative in, in the fixing of it versus just being like, that is not the phone call I want to get? I mean, we are so beyond low hanging fruit at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, so as a as an IoT company, we don't actually have a um, a product device that you you know slam in a refrigerator or put in a 
in a car. Uh, our technology is, is software that allows for interoperab interoperability across devices, so it doesn't matter uh, whether you're using a, a Google Home system or a Philips light bulb or um, you know, a Samsung sensor. Um, we get all the devices to, to talk to one another. Um, so the, the, the short answer is of, of who we want to talk to, None of them. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't really know, to be honest with okay. you. I, don't, I really haven't thought that far kind of down the road here. Great. I'm going to open it up for questions. All right, over here. And do I still have my microphone? There you go. Kelly, can you identify yourself? Sure. Uh, Kelly Emmerich with the Secure ID Coalition. Um, so I think it's an interesting, great discussion. Uh, I love the idea of the ecosystem as a broader living, breathing platform. I guess the next the question I have is what about the identity layer? Who is the individual or where's their data? Who are the humans behind this? And what are we doing about that data? As you know, my temperature thermostat in my house, maybe I don't care that my neighbors know that you know I like my temperature at 72, but my connected scale, maybe I do. So where where is that? identity layer fit? So from, from what InterDigital does, so our technology right now is actually being run uh, just outside of London in Birmingham uh, in the UK's One Transport program. Uh, all of that data that is provided to uh, Transportation uh, Ministry in the UK is all anonymized. Um, so we don't know whether it's myself or Arena or Chris uh, who, who have uh, uh, passed by a, a sensor. We just know that an event happened. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, at that point it's incumbent upon uh, the devices um, and, and whether or not they're collecting, you know, whether you've bought your scale and, and you've put your data into that scale. Um, you know, we would say we do anonymize just fine. Um, but each device is, is tend to be a lot different. I mean, and I would say, to, when you bring it to the consumer point of view, I mean, it's a really difficult question because the home is by, de by definition identifiable, right? It's very easy to figure out where someone lives. So if you've broken the security in a home, you've got an awful lot of de facto identifiable information. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a, a perfect answer. Obviously, you're going to need to have the best security you can so as to prevent that kind of breach. I think you're going to need to, um, you know, rely, have good authentication technologies and, you know, obviously you're going to have to encrypt for authentication. You're going to have to, um, you know, think about things like the basics of changing passwords. And then more generally, I think you're going to have to, you know, think about, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but you have to think about whether you want to, every device to be smart and every device to do this stuff because there is going to be an element of risk that's going to be very hard to to you know completely deal with and so you're going to have to think about whether the benefit of a you know having an internet connection in your refrigerator outweighs your concerns about the potential security i think your question actually deals with two separate things one of which is cybersecurity and how do you protect somebody from hacking in and getting that uh, the second question deals with the one that you were uh, somewhat touching on, which is uh, the use of the data after it's acquired and who's using it and who are they sharing it with. And, the, you know, we could get into a long technical conversation about de-identification versus anonymization, and we can point to the GDPR's Article 29 Working Group, who's put together quite a, a lot of thought into those concepts. But at the end of the day, I think it, it comes down to the consumer at least has or should have the right to know that that data is being collected and is made potentially available to either bad actors or unintended or at least in my line of sight users and then make choices. And I, I agree, it may come down to as much as I like the convenience, I may have to say, you know what, I think I'll go back an era. Not likely, but I also may change, you know, the perceptions and hopefully we can change some of the realities about what data can be used by whom under what circumstances. So I think that's a back end solution to the problem. Great. Question over here. I said we've already gotten you, we'll come back to you, but we've got another gentleman over here. Just be fair to the side of the room. 
Thank you, Robert Thomas. I'm a reporter for MLEX. My question is about the cheating aspect. Um, it, the, the question grows out of the VW emission scandal. Uh, there were standards there. There was a lot of testing, and they cheated anyway, and they got away with it for years. Um, and a lot of pollution went in the air. This is a voluntary seal. Who watches the watchman? Who, who, who what, what, you know, there, there, there's absolutely no way to prevent cheating, but there is, there are ways to address it and get ahead of it a little bit. So, so I, I just wanted to ask you about the cheating aspect of this and how to mitigate it. I feel like we should have a blockchain discussion about that later. I, I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I refuse to say blockchain. That's everything. It's a magic, <laughs> magic answer to everything. Um, I mean, I would say that it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that the, the heterogeneous nature of this, the current ecosystem, and we have technologies from a wide variety of places, and they're all talking to each other, which is the Internet of Things in a nutshell. It also makes it a little harder to like hide if you're cheating, right? Especially when it comes to security standards. If you've got a device that's leaking data or sharing data much more promiscuously than is the norm, it's going to be a little harder, I think, to hide that when you've got to go through a third-party router, when you've potentially got to talk to other non-affiliated devices in a home. I don't know that that's a perfect solution by any stretch, and I think you'd have to, but I do think it might be a little more tricky than in that circumstance where you've essentially got a device where you control the entire car. It's really just one output that's being tested on a limited basis. That's a very different threat model than the constant sort of data conversation that's happening in the Internet of Things. Uh, that, that's my, it's a, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it a lot, so. I'm thinking there's going to be a new device called the Little Sister, and it's going to squeal on the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Wow, right here in the back. Uh, hello, I'm Lily. I'm from Whitehawk. We're a startup trying to help small to mid-sized businesses uh, with cybersecurity solutions. And this is a very interesting panel. And one thing I'm thinking about the sales uh, process, wouldn't be so much easier uh, instead of focusing on how to regulate every single little attack and technology from beginning, we focus on the end, meaning that if you're a sales, no matter what protection you do, at the end of the day, if your consumers are breached or your data are breached, you're gonna uh, suffer consequences. And another thought I have is thinking about wouldn't FTC, if they can start up a committee, just like FDIC, if a company or devices is actually certified if their data is breached somehow by some individuals or groups, uh, their consumers have a, a, a pool of budget that they can, came from to kind of compensate their loss. Uh, because at the end of the day, the consumers really are focusing is how to mitigate the loss. Do you have a draft piece of legislation I think mm -hmm. you just wrote that maybe you just want to like give to a member of Congress? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? So I think that's very similar um, in at least basic concept to the original California law around breach. The idea there wasn't that we're going to come in and tell you how not to be breached. The idea was if you had a breach, you had to tell your customers you had it. Um, as you know, I, I go back to the fact I'm an old auditor, right? And um, I remember for years and years and years going in and doing security audits and trying to convince people to do things because it was required and it was regulated. And, and they, some did, some didn't, in better for worse. But when the breach law came out and companies had to tell their consumers they lost their data, there was suddenly a recognition at much higher levels in the organization that this mattered, security mattered. It mattered to their brand, it mattered to their product, it mattered to their business. We've come a long way down the road since those original breach lo notification laws. But I think um, sunlight, sunshine, was a very valuable tool to uh, address some of the issues. So it's similar to what you're saying, it's not quite the same, but it was very effective, I can tell you. We're going to title it well, the vitamin D law. Yeah, though I, I might be just a tiny bit more cynical because I do feel like when we were there at the time, we were saying, this is going to prevent breaches because we're going to, you know, the, the sunlight. Yeah. And, and I feel like what ended up happening is we ended up with sort of a cottage industry of people who had to deal with breaches, <laughs> right? Like, but at least people like, knew they were being breached before yeah. the, that they weren't even necessarily aware. So I, 
I, I agree. I, I think we have come a ways. I do think we've elevated cybersecurity. I don't want to be overly cynical about it, but I, I did kind of love the back end of your thought, which was sort of the pooling of, of resources to, to begin to like find ways to compensate consumers for harm. I'm not sure that's precisely the, the right way to do it, but I do think that thinking about the fact that we're going to have consumers who are going to be harmed, and that's a fact of the system, and thinking about how we're going to go about compensating or helping those consumers now is a, is a great piece of the puzzle. All right, I can take one more question um, over here, the gentleman in the, uh, I think it was Gingham, but I'm not sure I'm calling that right. Hawkeye's <laughs> okay, like, Gingham, what's she talking about? <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Patrick and I'm from uh, Global Policy Group. And so my question, or first off, there seems to be a bit of an arms race between cyber weapons and the cyber security deployed, uh, you know, to prevent hacking. And so my question is, what are the efforts, or is there anything that can be done uh, to decrease the use of cyber weapons, sort of approach this problem uh, from the other end instead of just bulking up cybersecurity? Right, so I'm just going to remind you we're at a consumer event. I'm totally with you on the question, but th we had to choose a topic today. Okay. So we're staying in the consumer space. So from the idea, I'm going to rephrase, if you don't mind, sure. permission, um, to that if you have realized that you might have something inside your platform, one of the platforms, big one, let's say car, that you feel like for, has been hacked and been weaponized. Is that a way of rephrasing your question? The different question. He's like, it's not my question anymore. Who cares? <laughs> right. And it's not gingham, right? Um, so I guess the idea of weaponization, if we've got things that, are, that become a weapon in your system and what can we do to mitigate it? It comes back to your platform. Attack. Yeah. I, there's certainly, I mean, I think, to, I'm actually curious to answer your question too, but I think that there's your, your, the question of figuring out I want to say liability, but also responsibility throughout the ecosystem, especially as you build the devices. So if you plug in one of your devices into another device, you've got to like make sure you're being very mindful and thoughtful about the security and the and the the uh, you know the competence of, of of everybody in the supply chain, right? So you don't just plug in a bad product and then you've got. So I think that's something that you absolutely have to be aware of. Once it's become weaponized. I mean, I think that you got you've got a big problem, but you've also, um, you know, you've got a that's that's why we're building the this is the cybersecurity in so that we minimize the number of problems because they do, you know, the network effect is real for cybersecurity vulnerabilities too. Anybody else want to tag on to that? No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it is a, it's a tough one, and it's also how quickly can you inform. Right. Uh, and, and hopefully mitigate the, the problem. Thank you all for your time. You've been very patient. Please join me in thanking our panel. And I'm just going to comment that we still have plenty of food over here, and you have hungry interns and receptionists back in your office. So um, please feel free to take something back with you. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks.